Continuing a reading of Major Robert Crisp's Brazen Chariots, the finest narrative of tank warfare to come out of World War II, Los Angeles Times, third day, page 32. Up to now, everything had gone more or less according to plan, and the British armor was where it was intended to be. There was only one thing wrong. The Germans had not reacted. We had just not that big slogging match that was supposed to happen with the Panzer Divisions. And sneaking through the battalions on our side were disturbing stories that the Honeys and Crusaders were no match at all for the Mark Threes and Mark Fours in equal combat. It was a simple proposition. Our little cannons could not knock them out, and they could knock us out easily. The word 88 was invading the tank crew vocabulary as a symbol of shattering mutilation. Within the week, we were reckoning that it needed three honeys to destroy one Mark IV, and during that entire campaign, we were to find no effective answer to the enemy's use of anti-tank weapons well forward with his panzers. It was a technique that very nearly won him the battle and many subsequent desert battles in the years to come. Nobody had time even to make a brew in the morning. As soon as it got light enough to see, shells started falling among us from goodness knows where. Unseen shell fire can be very disconcerting, and there is none of the psychological relief of retaliation. We had no sooner got dispersed when tanks were reported, attacking the battalion's right flank. We took up hull-down positions to meet this threat, but within half an hour they were reported attacking on our left flank. This threat proved equally nebulous, and for two hours we sat gazing into space and sand. Away in the distance I spotted a column of vehicles replenishing with petrol, but could not be sure which side they belonged to. Neither could anybody else. The next alarm came over the air at noon in the form of a warning to expect a heavy attack from the north where tanks and transport were massing. We were assured by the information that the Royal Air Force was about to bomb this concentration. There had been plenty of air activity all morning, the first we had seen. The bombers never appeared where we could see them, but the message was good for morale. By this time, most of us were developing a sort of wolf-wolf complex, but we were startled into reality by a frantic call for help from B Squadron, who screamed that they were being attacked by over 100 tanks. The desert air was suddenly full of high explosive and the terrifying swish of armor-piercing shells coming in from the west very fast with the sun behind them shining straight into our gunner's eyes were scores of the dark, ominous shapes of German panzers. Going even faster, a few hundred yards ahead of them were B-Squadron's honeys together with a half-dozen soft-skin vehicles. They came hurtling back through A-Squadron, whose commander started yelling into his microphone, Halt! Halt the lot of you! Turn around and fight, you yellow bastards! I'll shoot the next tank I see moving back! At that rush came abreast of me. As that rush came abreast of me and the firing began to get personal, it was desperately hard not to turn round and join in it. I decided not to. At the same time, I didn't particularly want to die at that moment. Movement was the obvious answer, but movement in a direction which could not be described as running away. I could see the panzers clearly now coming down a broad depression in line abreast, 40 to 60 of them, easy enough to exaggerate, into a hundred and more. On my left was a low ridge, the southern edge of the depression, and I made for this flat out with my troop conforming in the hope of getting on the flank of the advancing juggernauts and getting out of the direct line of fire. Once over the ridge, I turned back along the crest to, to see what was happening and whether it would be possible to do any damage. The enemy onslaught was losing some of its impetus owing to lack of opposition, and with darkness falling fast, the Germans could not have claimed a great deal of success, although it must have given them a good deal of self-satisfaction. I noticed that two other honeys had joined my troop, and I led them in a wary circle to try to come up behind some of the flank Mark IVs. Dimly in the dusk, I saw the outlines of a couple of armored cars perched on the edge of the depression with both guns firing away to the east. I could not tell in that light whether they were British or German. It was a pity to miss such a nice opportunity to bag a couple of Jerry six-wheelers, if they were Jerry, so I decided to make a quick dash up to them to get a positive identification. If they turned out to be enemy, I could quickly let my other tanks know and they could knock them out. 
I made a hand signal to the troop sergeant to wait where he was and ordered my driver to speed up. No concealment was possible now, but I hoped to get up close enough before being seen. I got to within thirty yards of those two cars before I could be sure of the black cross painted on the turret. Then I told the driver left about and swung round in a great plume of sand and dust while I picked up the mic to tell my troop to open fire. Too late, I saw that my hand signal had either been unseen or misinterpreted. Five honeys were pursuing me, hell-bent in the gloom, one of them hurtling straight down on me. I could not warn my driver in time, but managed to divert him enough to avoid a broadside on collision. There was a rending crash, and I found myself inextricably locked with the driving sprocket and tracks on the oncoming honey. Out of the turret popped the ferocious face of the A squadron commander. The two armored cars, clearly disturbed by this unusual display just behind them, disappeared rapidly into the night. We disentangled ourselves, but my driving sprocket was hopelessly bent, and my honey had to get towed into lager. It was a considerably depleted and dispirited battalion that herded together that evening. What we wanted most of all was information. Where... What the hell was happening everywhere? Was this just the outside edge of a major battle? Who was winning? There were no replies. One of the operators got the BBC nine o'clock news, and we gathered round to hear the familiar, well-modulated voice saying, The Eighth Army, with about 75,000 men, excellently armed and equipped, has started a general offensive in the western desert with the aim of destroying the German-Italian forces in Africa. We were not the only troops listening to the nine o'clock news that night. The German monitors heard it, too. It was the vital piece of information that Rommel was lacking. The advance of Eighth Army into Libya had been so well concealed from the enemy that until they heard the BBC announcement, they were wholly unaware that this was a major offensive. Indeed, until the last moment, Rommel persisted in his view that the British were not capable of mounting a full-scale attack at that time. The BBC announcer really started something. Rommel, unaware that anything more than a reconnaissance in force had been projected, did not react in the way anticipated by our planners, and during the two days in which he had been expected to give battle to our concentrated forces, he had simply sat comparatively quiet trying to get the information. In these two days, the 8th Army commander, anxious to provoke some sort of decisive action and disturbed at his own inability to exert any influence on the situation, sent his three armored brigades probing offensively across Rommel's supply lines and towards the rear of the enemy forces investing Tobruk. It broke up the armored concentration at a decisive time and split it into three separate parts, each part inferior to the opposing tank force and unable to give quick assistance to each other. Operation Crusader and the war in the Middle East was very nearly lost, simply by Rommel's unbelief and inaction in those first two days. Now things were to start happening. The nights were no longer dark and silent. Our own loggers remained tombs of rest and replenishment, but the Germans, seeking protection in visibility, adopted exactly the opposite nighttime tactics and lit the desert all around their loggers with brilliant white and green flares and very lights fired continuously by their outlying pickets. It was a convenient arrangement, and it was just as well that at least one side knew where the other was during the hours of darkness. That night I got orders to take my troop out before first light to patrol the area ahead of the battalion which was to move due north at dawn.